Our final of the, uh, panel of the day will be a wide-ranging and very interesting conversation with the two director generals within Transport Canada who are responsible for aviation regulations and safety. Transport reorganized part of its structure recently, and these two officials are one of the results. Our panelists will discuss the division of responsibilities for these two director generals, some of the challenges they face in the management of aviation safety, and their key priorities, both domestic and international, which includes how Canada is, pro uh, Canada is progressing with the adoption of safety management systems. Canada has been a leader in aviation safety as evidenced by the fact that it was one of the first countries in the world to adopt safety management systems as a way of doing business. The operating environment is, in much of Canada is very demanding, so transport must strive to maintain the highest possible safety standards by taking into account the extremes of harsh weather during much of the year and flying into remote regions where air transportation is the only means for people and goods to connect with the rest of the world. Alpa's Canada Board Vice President, Captain Brian Shuri, who also serves on the Air Safety Organization Steering and Oversight Committee, will be moderating the panel for us this afternoon. Brian? Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Conversation with Canada. Just so we are clear, there's really only two conversations going on in Canada right now. One is about the Tragically Hip concert last Saturday, and the other one is about the U.S. presidential election. <laughs> but we will try to make this as interesting as possible uh, for you, and I hope you find it informative. As Mark said, my name is Brian Scher. I'm the Alpa Canada Vice President and also the IFALPA Director for Canada. In this role, my Alpa Canada executive colleagues and myself uh, have the opportunity to meet with uh, both Aaron and Denny on a regular basis and their staff to advocate for safety and security issues that affect our Alpa Canada pilot groups. It's my pleasure to introduce our two esteemed colleagues. As everyone knows, we're very fair and politically correct in Canada, so I'll introduce the gentleman in alphabetical order. I'll start with my French colleague first. Denis Guidon makes up uh, one half of the Director General team of Civil Aviation and Transport Canada. Denis has held his position since April 2015. His mandate is aviation safety oversight and transformation, including the delivery of national surveillance activities and safety services such as aircraft certification. Prior to his current position, Denny was the Director of National Operations in 2012, where he's responsible for the regulatory oversight of Canada's major airlines and the country's air navigation providers. On my left, I have Aaron McCrory, who is the other half of the Director General uh, team for Civil Aviation and Transport. He was also appointed in April 2015. Aaron's mandate within the Civil Aviation Directorate includes the Aviation Safety Framework, which includes establishing safety policies, regulations, and standards for aviation and aerospace in Canada. Aaron is equally responsible for the development of the guidance tools and instructions to help industry comply with regulations and for inspectors to oversee regulatory compliance. You'll find a more complete bio, of course, uh, both our guests in the ASF app, and I'd encourage you to check that out. So let's start our conversation with Canada. I have a few questions that I would like to start with, uh, but if anyone in the audience would like to ask any questions at any time, please feel free to step up to any one of the microphones and I'll be happy to recognize you. I'm gonna give you fair warning though. Uh, Tim Canole has told me that the reception bar will not open unless there is a minimum of three questions asked by the audience, so I'll ask you to consider that. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with Denny. Uh, Denny, having two director generals uh, in Canada is uh, somewhat unprecedented in the regulatory environment around the world. Uh, we can't think of another uh, regulator that operates that way. Um, could you explain why this occurred and maybe talk a little bit about your division of responsibilities? Thank you very much, uh, Brian, and hello, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation to come and discuss about uh, the Canada project uh, that Aaron and I were, were leading forward. Uh, basically, uh, Civil Aviation Canada has about 1,300 employees, 1,100 on the oversight program, about 200 on the reg framework. Uh, from a Canadian standpoint, it's an extremely large organization under a single DG, actually. Uh, usually, we, own, we have in Canada a lot of departments which are actually smaller than 1,300 employees under a deputy minister. We have to understand as well, in the government context, we operate a little bit differently, and it's not an uh, unusual thing to see at the deputy minister level to have two 
person holding the portfolio, and the same thing as the assistant deputy minister. So they just push down the same concept at the DG level. On top of that, I have to admit that civil aviation is extremely wide and complex. The mandate is just absolutely humongous. And with two DGs and spreading the duties in, in a way that makes sense, is permitting us to get more into the program and to deliver way more. In the last 18 to 20 months, it's amazing what we've done from an oversight perspective and as well from a reg framework perspective. I'm a product of aviation, so I run the operation, I run the system. While uh, Harren's got some skills I don't have, he's a policy person, so he's able to take all the stuff that I can't do myself. So this is working fairly well. Uh, so for my view, uh, I think that the transformation is very positive, and the question is more why we haven't that up to a system like this before. Did you want to add anything uh, to that, Aaron? Uh, no, I think Denise captured the reason why, as to why, and I guess I'm going to say hello again. Uh, Denise captured the reason as to why it, 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 it was done, and I think it was a really good decision. But I think the other part of it is it is working very well. Denise talked about uh, the different skills that we bring to the table, and Denise and I have worked together now for about four years, I think. Um, and I think we've complemented each other really well, and it's a good, strong working relationship. So it, 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 it needed to be done, and it's working. Right, right. And I think from our perspective, we found um, the access is actually a little bit easier, um, having the, the, the two divisions, if you will, and, and two people heading up the divisions to go to. So very interesting. Um, Denny, I'm going to start with you for the next question as well. It's sort of in, in your wheelhouse. Uh, transport, as we know, is currently under unprecedented, I would say, uh, financial constraints. And it's caused many issues, uh, including, uh, uh, for example, a ban on staff travel, or a, a more or less a ban on staff travel, uh, lots of cuts uh, in terms of fewer inspectors, uh, reducing the aircraft fleet, that kind of thing, uh, declining participation in industry events. Now, ELPA, as well as many of our industry partners and, and stakeholders, uh, sent a letter to the minister expressing concern over the state of affairs uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, we were rather disappointed with the response. Uh, in light of the continuing constraints, I wonder if you could start us off to talk about how, obviously it's clearly important for you and your staff to maintain contacts with all the stakeholders, how you plan to do that in this environment of uh, financial uh, constraints. That's a very good question, actually. It's been a demanding year, but I think we'll, it will be yielding a better organization at the end of the day. Uh, a few metrics just to understand a little bit more aviation in Canada, and, and, and the context is extremely demanding. We close to 1,500 aerodromes, a uh, very small country, only 40 million people, uh, close to 1,200 air operator certificate, 1,000 AMOs, uh, one of the largest piece of sky in the world that we, we control with a very dynamic uh, ENS providers, third largest manufacturing country in the world as well. So, and they're very, very dynamic, and we're turning out some fantastic products, such as the Mobile DC series and so on and so forth. All of that with 1,300 employees, right? In the last 10 years, uh, passengers uh, in planning, the planning in Canada has grown by about 50%. Manufacturing sectors have grown by 32%, uh, predicting the manufacturing sector to grow from uh, another 20-some percent in the next five or six years. At the same time, we're hitting uh, the baby boomers, which are going to retirement, and we're being hit with that. So some people would think it's a perfect storm. For me, it's a perfect conditions to recreate the next organization. So what we're doing in regards of the budgetary issues is, is the budget is not decreasing. The budget is remaining stable. So, and that's a challenge to be able to perform all of those functions and the increased volume of activities with the same amount of people. So the question is, how can we do the job a little differently, right? And, and for us, is, is again, is to be uh, having our inspectors at the right place, right time, on the right file. And if you look right now in Canada from an oversight perspective, we have accomplished in 2015 more inspection than 2014, and 2016 we'll do more inspection than, than last year. So we've protected that. At the same time, uh, we are protecting uh, the certification of the product to bring them to the market. So uh, all the core activities are being protected while we're embarking into a transformation project to find some ways of doing the job differently. So that's from a CIVA perspective. From a department perspective as well, we're embarking and supporting what we call a comprehensive review. So we're really looking through all of our activities internally within the department, see what we can stop doing, but at the same time, see what we can add as far as activities. So it's, it's a very fair approach in, in what the system tomorrow should be. I think we'll make some decision towards the end of fall. 
the minister will get involved naturally and then we'll be able to recreate the next system. Um, so challenging, but at the same time, from a change management perspective, I think it's, it's, it's the right thing happening to us at this point in time. Okay, fair enough. Uh, over to you, Aaron, uh, for the next one. Um, as we know, the Minister of Transport is currently consulting Canadians uh, right across the country on how to regulate air transport uh, to be more proactive and responsive to rapidly changing technologies, largely as a result of the CTA review. Uh, that occurred over the last couple of years. A good example is the unmanned aircraft systems. Um, we have a CARE Act process in Canada, very similar to the Air Act process here in the States, and it's long been the formal vehicle for bringing about change. But uh, a lot of us in the industry uh, believe that it's, it's just too slow, too cumbersome um, in an industry where technology and the developments are really demanding, obviously. So I, I was wondering, Aaron, if you could identify some of the key bottlenecks uh, that you see in our CARE Act process and, and what you would like to change uh, if you do indeed see bottlenecks in that process and uh, what roles industry and stakeholders like ELPA can play. Okay. It, it, it's a great question. It's, it's not a new question in many respects. Um, uh, the Auditor General came in and looked at the Office of the Auditor General, uh, which is, I think, similar to the uh, Office of the Controller General here in the States, came in and looked at our program a, a few years ago and cited that as one of the, uh, the, the weaknesses in our program. So we've been looking at how can we improve our processes um, for quite some time. And I'll talk a little bit about what we've done to improve them and some of the things that we need to do. I think, first of all, though, you need to recognize that we are operating in a political environment, a political environment that's unique to Canada, and, and, and that is going to have an impact on the pace of change sometimes in terms of the pol political appetite to implement certain regulations uh, to move them forward quicker or, or, or slower. Um, and, and that's no different than any other democratic system. Uh, the other part is the government of Canada has unique processes that we need to follow, and you'll hear us talking about Canada Gazette 1, Canada Gazette 2. There are requirements that we need to follow to get into that process in terms of doing a cost-benefit analysis, regulatory impact assessment statement. So that's outside of our control. So we've got to accept that as a given, and that consumes a certain amount of time. Um, but there are things that we can control, and, and I think that's what you're getting at, Brian, in terms of the, the bottlenecks. And so one of the things that we've done is we have revised our CARE Act process, and this has been, we, we launched that uh, revised process a couple of years ago. And there the focus was moving away from working groups and, uh, and never-ending consultation with stakeholders and never-ending attempts to build consensus and moving towards a more dynamic process where if we needed to have people come together, we'd bring the, the experts into a room in something called a focus group where issues could be identified, assessed, and mitigations developed as recommendations going in, out from that. Um, and then a more nimble process that didn't require consensus but had the right people in the room addressing the issue and then bringing it back into the department to look at. I think we've achieved some efficiencies because of that process, moving away from the old model that we used to have. Um, and Denis may talk about this in a bit when we talk about transformation, but we're also now looking at, at, at from a, a larger point of view, is, is, is managing our regulatory files better. And I like to use the analogy, or talk about the regulatory life cycle uh, and, and looking at the full um, cycle in terms of issue identification, developing your solutions, implementing those solutions, making sure you have the tools for those solutions and assessing what you've done. And by taking a more holistic approach to how we regulate and leaning the processes associated with it, I think we're gonna achieve some uh, improvements in the time. Because part of that is, is at the outset a better and I talked about this in the context of SMS this morning, better understanding of the policy issues around it. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? What's the best way to solve it? And what's the most appropriate tool to solve it? And too often we've gone down a regulatory path without necessarily properly defining the problem, properly defining whether or not we have the authority to do it, and properly looking at are there other instruments that we could use to do that. So if we're not doing that fundamental policy work up front, inevitably those questions come up. And then you're going to have to deal with them later. And they actually add to the time. And we ha we've had a, a fairly significant regulatory file, for example, that we've been working on in the last couple of years. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, probably weeks before we're going into the room to start drafting the regulations, somebody asked the question, do we have legal authority to do this? It was a little bit late in the game to be asking that question. And it took six months to resolve that issue. That question should have been asked four or five years ago. And so we're trying to build a process and change how we do things to ask that question at the up step 
rather than so late in the game because that, that's how, that's the bottlenecks. It's the inefficient processes where people aren't talking to each other that, and, and questions coming up at the last minute as opposed to being addressed up front is where some of the bottlenecks are. The other part is, is, is giving, uh, having a better consultation process and, and, and ensuring that people understand why we're consulting and what we're trying to accomplish when we consult. So there's a moment in time when we're going to go out to the community and say, we don't know how to solve this problem. Help us solve it. We want to hear from people. and We'll have a debate and discussion. We're going to develop mitigation options. There's another moment in time where we've decided and we've provided a recommendation to the minister and the minister's made a decision that we're going to sit down with people and say, this is what we're, we're doing and this is why. That's not an, an opportunity, and in the past, that was an opportunity to debate. It's not an opportunity to debate anymore. The decision has been made, this is where we're going, and, and rather than continue the discussion, we're gonna move forward in terms of regulating. Um, so I, I think we've had some success um, with the new processes we put in place, we can, and we need to do better. Uh, but, you know, Denis alluded to this in, in his remarks in terms of some of our accomplishments in the last year. Uh, we put out uh, a new Aerodrome Standards uh, and Recommended Practice document uh, last year, TP312 5th edition. Um, we put out NPAs for runway and safety areas. Um, and uh, uh, what else have we done here? Um, crew resource management, uh, we published in Canada Gazette 1, new regulations for seaplane operations, new regulations for winter maintenance, uh, minimum takeoff performance, uh, aerodrome work consultations. Uh, we put out interim orders related to flight deck occupants. Uh, we've, we're moving forward with the flight and duty time regulations. Uh, we've published an NPA, a notice of proposed amendment for unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, so we've, 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 been, we've, we've really turned the corner, I think. Not, we're not done in terms of improving the process, but we've turned the corner and we're starting to generate uh, the progress on the regulatory front that I think we need to do. One final thought, sorry, I'm a little bit scattered here. Instrument selection is a key part of this. I think I alluded to this, but not every problem needs to be regulated. And we talked about it this morning in the context of SMS, is leveraging other tools to address the safety issue far more quickly than we can through regulation. We need to make use of all the tools in our toolbox as we try to change behaviors. You know, it's interesting. When you mentioned the aerodrome uh, piece there, that really caught my attention. Um, I'm one of those lucky people. I, I have a, a grass strip in my farm. And um, uh, so that particular process caught my attention from the point of view how fast it actually moved through the process. Now I'm going to juxtapose that against the flight time duty time file. I think that's what you're alluding to in the, in the justice comment there. And um, uh, that's a particular file, obviously, that's near and dear to our hearts. And um, is, is there, obviously, the CARE Act process has to continue, Gazette 1, Gazette 2, it's legally mandated. Uh, there's no way to, um, you know, uh, find a, a, a side door to, to get around those. Can you see any other way, in, in especially an issue that's so important, that's fatigue-related, we all agree that science-based uh, flight time, duty time is long overdue in Canada. Can you see a way that in the interim, uh, we could possibly get some interim relief because we see the implementation timetable, as we talked about earlier today, uh, is way out there, especially for the 702, 703, 704 carriers, and it's a huge concern to us. Even in the 705 side of the equation, um, by the time we get through Gazette 1, Gazette 2, we're talking 2019 for, for implementation, which is a long way out. Do um, you have any comments on that? There's a lot of lot in there, and, and, and what's interesting, what I'd like to start with is if you compare those two regulatory packages, the one for flight and duty time, the one for aerodrome consultations, you're right, uh, the latter went through really quick. Right. It was also one that we used the new process on, right? So, so, that, so it speaks a little bit, and it, it's not a completely fair comparison because it was not nearly as controversial, and let's be realistic, the more controversial, the more debate in the community, it, it, the tougher it is to move through the system. I don't see, um, and just a correction, our, our intent is not to include 702, so it's 703, 704, Correct, yeah. 705. Um, I don't see any um, short-term or in-term steps uh, uh, to fill that regulatory gap, to be quite honest. Um, but what I am seeing and what I am hearing is from industry who are starting to see that maybe especially because we're going to offer fatigue risk management systems as an ultimate means of compliance, we're seeing some operators come in to us and say, we want to, on day one, to have that FRMS in place, and they're starting to see it as a competitive advantage. So the market and other forces may drive some of the operators to implement sooner rather than later because that's going to be to their benefit. 
One of the other uh, issues that's come up for us in the past in terms of, you know, it involves stakeholder engagement and uh, proper processes, we were really process driven, uh, was in the aftermath of German wings uh, when the minister decided to make a, uh, an interim order, change the regulation essentially, modify it. Um, based on that, and we didn't see a lot of industry uh, consultation or wide stakeholder consultation. Uh, do you see that changing at all in, in the future? Because obviously we're all about evidence-based uh, risk assessment um, uh, based decisions. And uh, even in the heat of the moment uh, which that decision was made, um, obviously from our perspective, we, we want to see a, a more robust process. Mm -hmm. You know, the jury's still out on that one, um, and, and uh, Parliament gave uh, the, uh, the Minister of Transport the authority to put in place an interim order that's good for a year. It's a tool that's available to deal with, with an, uh, uh, I won't use the legal language, but an imminent or urgent safety or security issue. Uh, and that, by its very nature, does not lend itself to consultation. But Parliament, in its wisdom, said, but we're going to only allow it for a year mm -hmm. so that you can do that consultation. Uh, and so we're going through the process. We put out a, a notice of proposed amendment based on that, that interim order. We got a lot of feedback from uh, all stakeholders on it. As a result of that, we were on a, a track uh, to put that into regulation, that interim order, make that regulatory uh, this spring. Uh, but we, we stopped largely based on the feedback we got through that consultation process. We haven't yet nailed down where we're gonna go. We may, we may still end up with that in regulation but we're taking more time to analyze the issue based on the, state, the feedback we've got from stakeholders. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a lesson learned for us in terms of how we can improve the process going forward, but sometimes the very nature of the incident doesn't lend itself to consultation at that moment. Our process allows for the consultation, though, before we finalize things. Fair enough. Did you want to add anything to that, Denny? No, he's my, he's my policy. You don't want to wade into that one at all? Okay. <laughs> you can take the flight and duty time questions if you want. <laughs> All right, uh, what I'd like to do now is we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'd like to ask anyone in the audience that has any questions for uh, Denny or Aaron to uh, step forward. Earlier on we heard Transport Canada are leading the pack on SMS. You're identifying and managing your risk proactively. You're asking that to be done at company level, at uh, operator level, uh, and consequently, risks are avoided, mitigated early on. And yet you've identified fatigue relief and have agreed a new uh, law that is based on scientific and medical evidence which isn't gonna come in until 2019. Sorry, I'm a little confused as to how those two things sit together. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's clearly an operational question. I think, so. <laughs> I think it's about the regulation. See how well the two DGs work together. Yeah. I mean, you know, first of all, first of all, um, we've implemented SMS for a portion of our industry. It covers off a significant portion of the traveling public, but it is only for a portion of the industry. So I, I think we're, we're not yet in a position where we can say that from a regular, regular and this is one of the weaknesses I think on, on the regulatory side of the house, is we're not yet in a position to definitively say what are our top five, six, seven safety risks. We've started some work in that area, and I can talk about that if you want, uh, but, but where operators are proactively identifying risks, it doesn't mean it's necessarily happening at the safety, at the system level, and that's a gap in our, in our, in our process. Um, the, the time that it's going to take to implement the flight and duty time regulations, um, you know, we, we talk about being process driven and, and um, uh, you know, it's not the most satisfying of answers, but sometimes regulation is the art of the possible, not, not necessarily the art of what you want. And uh, we, the people that I have working on flight and duty time regulations passionately believe in this. We believe in the need for these regulations, but we also need to recognize that there, there's other sides to this equation, and one of the key messages that we heard moving forward with this file was the time that some of our operators needed to take it right. And if the price that we have to pay is a little bit more time to get those regulations in place, that was the compromise that we were willing to make, because it was more important to us to have those regulations in place than to, to lose an argument over timelines. That's my blunt answer. Then. I may add from, a, from an SMS perspective as well, I think that 
where the organization is at this point in time. We've, we've learned quite a lot in the last 10 years from an SMS perspective. Uh, I think somewhat we, I don't like to say this, but we create somewhat the perfect storm in 2005. When we started pushing SMS into the large airline at the same time, we decided to reorganize to break the silos internally between the, the different specialties we have. And on top of that, we've decreed that we would bring a quality management system internally at the same time. So it took us more or less with the larger airlines close to, from my perspective, 10 years to get there. I do remember in 2005 actually having a discussion with the CEO of Air Canada when we explained to him that, you know, from a management system, we were going to be bringing this SMS into a three-year process where every year you'll have to add a few more things to your system. And in 2009, we'll come and visit you to do what we call an SMS assessment to review your full program. Well, not only did the airline needed to learn uh, the management system, but as well transport counter inspectors and the way we manage the program. When I look at uh, the last few uh, assessments we did in the very large operators in Canada, I can tell you that it took actually 10 years to get them there. So not only we had an indigestion, I can't pronounce that name in English, but anyway, not only we had Billy Hake uh, at transport in regards to introducing SMS and so is the industry, uh, but right now we're saying, well, with everything that we need to go through and the reorganization that we've done and the transformation that we need to embark upon, uh, we're extremely careful in introducing some very large system to our workforce and as well with the industry. Um, you can just imagine as an example for us operating a system as wide as the aviation in Canada, that if we push a safety management system on top of FRMS, to the 702, 703, 704 industry, that's about 650 certificate. Uh, it's, it's, it's a mouthful. Uh, so what is the impact on the workforce? What is the impact on the industry to pushing all of these things at the same time, right? So, and, and a lot of things that I hear from, from my side, on the operational side, and as well Aaron, is, is you're introducing a lot of things. I mean, you need to think about us, and, and as an example, introducing FRMS and introducing the new flight duty time, as a singular shot across the full industry, is uh, what is the cost of transformation? Can the industry is able to cope with all of this at the same time? If, if the flight and duty time regime is more costly for the industry, and the 702 carriers the three, the four, and the five has to do that at the same time, are we creating more of a safety issue in the lower segment of the industry? So as a regulator, those are the questions that comes to us all the time that we need to, to grasp think of, discuss, and, and, and make a decision at the end of the day. Interesting. Uh, Captain Adamus. Uh, thanks, uh, Brian, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Denny and Aaron, for your uh, remarks uh, today. Um, you, you partially answered the question on flight and duty times, the implementation process. I just want to flush it out a little bit more. Uh, currently, it's going to be 12 months implementation for 705 operators after Gazette 2, which sometime in 20. Uh, 17, um, but it's 48 months for 704 and 703. And while I can understand a little bit longer for the smaller operators, three extra years, wh what was the rationale behind that? Because that seems a little bit extreme to me. And I think in, in a lot of cases, the smaller operators, the pilots are not only flying the aircraft, but they're loading and unloading. Uh, some of these aircraft don't have autopilot. So you can almost argue sometimes they need it more than the large carriers. Just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. We, you know, again, um, Dan, I, it, I'll give you essentially the same answer. Part of it was we, we were confronted with some choices in terms of the scope and scalability of, of the regulatory package that we wanted to put together. And we thought it was very important to make, to, to make sure that all those passenger carrying operations had new fatigue rules in place. We had a moment, an opportunity to get in there, uh, and from our point of view, as we looked at the, the, the conflicting interests, quite frankly, in term, on that particular file, that the compromise that made sense to get the rules in place, um, based on the feedback that we're getting from operators telling us how much time they needed uh, to implement, to Denise's point, the, the effect on the industry as a whole as they tried to digest this fairly significant regulatory change, the 48 months, and we debated a whole bunch of different timeframes, but ultimately the decision was made around 48 months. 
It was the compromise that we felt was required to successfully get those regulations in place that would set the operators up for success in terms of implementing them and to give us time to prepare uh, for oversight of that. Thanks. Looks like Captain Benoza. Ed Benoza with the uh, Air Canada Pilots Association. The uh, flight and duty time uh, file is very, very dear to my heart and uh, we've been watching it evolve over the last five or six years and, and we're getting uh, down to the, uh, to the end. Uh, I am deeply concerned with the, uh, the flight time limits. In Canada, uh, I can take my airplane and I can leave Toronto and I can fly for 14 hours, two pilots, any time of the day and night. Uh, I arrive in uh, Frankfurt, uh, Munich, Tel Aviv, and I see my American counterparts, they have a uh, eight hour stick time limit after uh, eight o'clock at night. Um, their flights are augmented. They look very, very well rested. Um, I'm, I'm hanging from the shoulder harnesses after being up for 10 or 11 hours at night. Um, the flight time duty time file in Canada, uh, the way it's looking is we're not going to get any relief. There is not going to be a max stick time with those regulations. Uh, with the time you have in there, I'll still be able to leave Toronto 11 o'clock at night and fly for 12 hours, uh, two pilots, uh, no augmentation. Uh, we're one of the few countries in the world that will be allowed to do that. Um, I won't put you on the spot uh, with asking you why it's going to be like that, but I, I, I think and I implore you to please look at that. Uh, leaving at midnight and flying for 12 hours is a long, long time for two guys. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I, mean, I think to, it, uh, what, I, what I would say to that, and, and, and I, I, I'm not at all dismissing the frustration uh, in terms of the timelines, the implementation timelines, which is compounded, quite frankly, by forget about publishing Canada Gazette 1 in 2016, 17. We've been at this file for longer than I've been in civil aviation. Um, and that's where I go back to your original question, Brian, was, you know, the, the, it's a great example of how not to develop a regulation. Uh, it's a negative example of how we need to change how we do things. So I'd let, I can point to more recent successes in terms of how we've gotten better at things. Unfortunately, we've learned how to get better at that on this particular, because of the negative lessons on this particular file. And, and so I, I get your frustration. I, 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 I'm sympathetic to it. I, I'm not dismissing it. Um, but we're trying to make the best of we can with the situation we're at to move this forward again, because I, I go back to the colleagues that I have working on this file. And, you know, Ed, they're more passionate about, or at least as passionate about this as you are. Uh, and, and they won't be happy until we get this into regulation. And that's what our goal is. Thanks, Aaron. Well, that is perfect timing. Uh, that'll be our last question. And I hope everyone found the conversation with Canada informative and uh, useful. And uh, I want to thank both uh, Denny and Aaron once again for making themselves available. Um, we have a fantastic relationship with them in Canada. It's a relationship based on trust and respect, and we uh, know that will continue. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you both again uh, for making our Aviation Safety Forum 2016 a great success. Thank you, gentlemen.